Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you. And it's always helpful to have a personal testimony in regard to wanting, you know, inviting people in and and uh, when you see ambition and the desire to see change in your life, and that can be helpful for others as well. My name is Pete, and I get to be one of the pastors here at Epiphany Station. We're going to be talking about money in the sense of its eternal value. Now, we understand that you can't take it with you, so it's temporary in that sense. But the impact that we have, the opportunity that we have as followers in Christ, followers of Jesus, to use our money in ways that he designed us to use it. Before we talk about that, however, I'm just going to briefly mention and most of you, if not all of you, are aware of, of the turmoil that's going on right now over in Israel. Uh, we're in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the Hamas terrorists have uh, struck against the nation of Israel, and Israel is defending itself uh, currently. And I'm reminded of Jesus' words when he's referring to the end times, and because we know that it's a powder cake. You think about Israel, this little tiny country size of New Jersey, and they're surrounded by enemies. And if it's not the hand of God, I don't know what it would be. I mean, it's pretty obvious. And so uh, Jesus talks about the importance of being ready. Being ready. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour of Christ's return. But we're called to be ready. We're called to pay attention to the seasons, to the times. And, and the days are evil. The days are evil, and out of that, the Lord is going to do some amazing things because why? He's sovereign. He's not up there wringing his uh, hands, wondering what he's going to do next. He's, he's fully in charge, and so we can take heart and uh, be praying for that situation. Eternity. Eternity is for keeps, and this is something that we need to really come to grips with every day of our lives. Not, not in the sense that I wonder if this is going to be the day that I, that I die. No, that, that would be living in fear. We're not called to live in fear. It's, it's a good thing and, and it's, uh, it's okay for us to know that God has our days numbered in his hands, in his time. But in the meantime, we have resources that God uh, provides for us. He calls us to use. And, and for some, we have uh, much, and for others, it's little. But the point is, it comes from Him. It began, it originated with Him in the first place. And if we uh, look at Psalm chapter 50, we read about that very thing, that all the animals of the forests are mine, says God, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. So not only the cattle on a thousand hills, but he owns the moose on Highway 59. We were heading south, uh, the car was heading from the, uh, heading north, and we both had to stop and we waited for that moose to saunter off into the cornfield. So they are making a comeback, there's no question about that. But the, the point is, God owns it all. God owns it all, and when he blesses people in certain ways, with resources, with riches, so on and so forth, that in itself is not a bad thing. Sometimes uh, people are led to believe that uh, if people have riches, that it's inherently bad. It's not. God blessed Solomon, King Solomon, who had asked God for wisdom. Solomon uh, was granted wisdom by God, and besides that, God gave him riches. Money is not a bad thing. It's a tool, as Maddie's talked about earlier. But here's the critical piece. The question that we need to deal with is, in dealing with my money, that's what we're talking about today, in dealing with my money, the most important question that I can ask myself isn't about the money itself, but it's about my knowledge about God. And not only my head knowledge, but my heart knowledge. How well do I know God? 
A.W. Tozier, he was a well-known author, theologian, he said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Do you know a God who has your best interests in mind? Do you know that God desires for you better things than you desire for yourself? And when I say that, I'm not talking about money per se in terms of a whole bunch of money. I don't mean it in that sense. He knows our needs. He knows the level of our needs. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all places at all times. He doesn't and isn't taken by surprise at any time. And so if you're, whether you're struggling with money to make ends meet, or whether it seems to consume you in ways that you know isn't healthy. The important thing to keep in mind is what I know and what I think about God is the most important thing in the use of my money. I want you to think for a moment and imagine if someone were to ask you to have lunch with anyone that you would choose to have lunch with, anybody dead or alive, if you could have a conversation, a lunch conversation with somebody, who would that person be? Maybe it's, it's a famous athlete, and you just love to get to know that person and find out all about them. Maybe it's a past president, somebody that was very influential in life. Or maybe it would simply be somebody that you already know really, really well, and it's based on a relationship that you've developed with them. You've been affirmed by them over and over again. You affirm them. But they also challenge you in ways that regular folks, regular people may not challenge you. They may tell you hard things that you need to hear. Things that you need to hear because you need to change your ways. Well, this happened to a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was short little guy, and he was also well known in his area. From the city of Jericho, Jericho is uh, just a short distance from Jerusalem, and he had heard that this man named Jesus was coming through his neighborhood. Now, it's interesting to note that in the chapter before, uh, chapter 19 that we're about to read, Jesus is stopped in his tracks by a blind man who's calling out for help. Son of David, that was one of the references to Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me, is what the blind man called out to Jesus. And Jesus stopped in his tracks. And he, and he said, he ordered that the man be brought to him. And so he was, and Jesus healed him. Jesus was always so approachable, and he always had time for everybody, even the Pharisees, even the religious people. Now, the things that he had to share with them was a little bit different than the things that he had to share with people that already knew their need for change and knew their need for Jesus. But Jesus always, 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 always took time for people, and this is no different here in the, the account of Zacchaeus. So I'm going to read beginning at verse 1 of Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. He tried to get a good look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. A few details here that we need to note. Zacchaeus, yes, he was a tax collector, which was pretty much an enemy to his fellow Jews because he was the one that took their money. 
and not only for the taxes for the Roman government, but he would keep some for himself. Not only was he a tax collector, but he was the chief tax collector for that region. But another thing that was very interesting about Zacchaeus is he was excited. He was anticipating getting to even see Jesus. That's what his purpose was, to get up into this sycamore tree, easy to climb, got up in that tree, and to his surprise, Jesus stops, looks up at him and says, Zacchaeus, he calls him by name, approachable. I'm coming over to your house. Jesus is inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus is all excited and ready for the meeting with Jesus. And then we get to verse 7. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Now, in the first place, why was Zacchaeus so excited to see Jesus? Well, wasn't everybody excited to see Jesus? I mean, all the healings that he did. And he had just healed that blind man, Bartimaeus, before this account. But I suspect that there were a lot of things about Jesus that just that just exuded, you know, the desire for people just to be right there with him. He was approachable. Jesus wasn't going to turn anybody down. But he had an issue. Zacchaeus had an issue with these people and whoever else because he wasn't being honest with them. He wasn't being fair. And they knew it. And it had to do with money. He was very rich. So, it reminds me of the fact that it, it's very important that as followers of Jesus Christ, if, if, if I declare myself to be a follower of Jesus, then my actions are going to back my words, or at least they better back my words, because if they don't, then we have issues. Zacchaeus is already known as a notorious sinner, so he's not claiming to be a follower of Jesus yet. So, getting back to if I'm a follower of Jesus, my actions back my words. It reminds me of an acronym. Do what you say you will do. In genuine fashion, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I will do what I say I will do. Do I do it perfectly? No. Do I seek to do it in a way that honors God? Yes. If you're in a courtroom full of your peers and they're going to decide your fate and you've been convicted of being a follower of Jesus Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, we're talking about money this morning. And so we'll use it in that context. That, for example, if, if I owe somebody money, and it's agreed upon, it's been agreed upon, we shook hands, uh, that I would pay it back in a certain amount of time. And that time came and it elapsed and I didn't make good on paying back that money. I think that's an issue. You think that's something that honors God? Of course it doesn't. We would sort of be identified at that point as, uh, he says he's a Christian, she says that she follows Jesus, but you know what? They owe me money. They never paid it. See, there's, there, there's, there's an issue here. And sometimes when we say that God's opinion of me is the only one that matters, I understand the sentiment there. But if we dig a little bit farther, we find out maybe that I probably should be paying attention to what people think about me when it comes especially to the way I use my money. And so while money can have eternal impact, it can also be a means in which we cut that impact off by the words that we use and by the actions that we don't follow through on. Zacchaeus, not yet a follower of Jesus, but he was about to be. 
Let's go on to read. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. There's a word here in the New Living that we can all think about today. That word is meanwhile. Meanwhile. We don't know dialogue that took place between Zacchaeus and Jesus. Just says the verse before us. All these people said he's, he's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Zacchaeus being that sinner. Meanwhile, something transpired in that conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus that just blew Zacchaeus' world apart. What he had been striving for up to then to apparently be a rich, very rich chief tax collector had lost its meaning and caused him to become a different person. We have a word for that. We call it repentance. Is turning, whether it's physically or symbolically, turning around the direction that I'm going is not the right one. I need to go back this way. And that wasn't because Zacchaeus all of a sudden became so smart. It's because he had had an encounter with the living God. And he was never going to be the same. It's interesting to note, if we look at the Torah, the book of Numbers, Zacchaeus would have known this. A numbers guy, a tax collector. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, men or women, betray the Lord by doing wrong to another person, they are guilty. Jesus responded. Oh, that, that's okay. They must confess their sin and make full restitution for what they have done, adding an additional 20% and returning it to the person who was wrong. Zacchaeus went above and beyond what it said in the book of Numbers to do. His heart was changed. But here's the thing. I believe up to that point, before that meanwhile happened, I believe that Zacchaeus was settling for far too little in life. You think, well, what, what do you mean, far too little? I mean, he is a very wealthy man. That's just the point. That's just the point. Money, money isn't really what is at the core of what matters in life. We know that. But money is just simply an outreach of what is happening internally, inwardly, in my heart. The way in which we value money is a reflection of the condition of our heart. And Zacchaeus realized that, you know, we, we talk about loving God and loving people, and Jesus helped him to understand with his heart that he needed to love people in a way that would just completely not only surprise him, but amaze the people that had just called him a notorious sinner. And now he was going to show them otherwise. That he was a follower of Jesus. And so not only was he not going to settle for so little anymore, because he had found something genuine. He had found the love, the grace, the peace that only Jesus could give him, not money. He was freed. He was delivered. And I just find it fascinating that Jesus uses the word here, salvation. Again, we don't know what that conversation was about 
But Jesus certainly got through to Zacchaeus and, and the wrong road that he was going and Zacchaeus' desire to make things right. There's a chapter in Hebrews. We refer to it as the, the Hall of Fame for Believers. Certain people who are commended for their faith. But you know, they, they didn't... Uh, they didn't realize everything, all the promises of God before they died. And so we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. We're talking about eternity today. It's for keeps. Whether we're talking about the men and women in that great uh, chapter of faith who didn't yet receive all of God's promises, but with faith they look forward, or whether we're talking about ourselves here today. You know, so, some of you maybe don't have a struggle with money, whether it's too little, too much, whatever, and you're living in harmony with others. But here's the thing. We all need deliverance from something in our lives. And the Lord is so approachable. He doesn't turn anybody down. He's looking for tender hearts is what it is. And, and Zacchaeus' heart was changed that day in a very supernatural way. So here's the question. What is your mean while? We don't know those words that were exchanged between Zacchaeus and Jesus. But they were powerful. To change a life, to change a heart. What is your mean while? What's... what's What's going on between the time that you receive Jesus into your heart and, and, and the day where you leave this earth? You breathe your last. There's a big amount of space there that's, that's the meanwhile. And, and maybe it's going to be personified by, by a, a, a certain special kind of meeting that you have with the Lord and he orchestrates in such a way that it, it just dawns on you what it is that you need to be delivered from, whether it's money or other things. What is your meanwhile? What, what is it that potentially is, is keeping you from experiencing the depth of knowing who God is and the fact that there isn't a pit that you can dig that is that he is able to reach down and pull you out. And, and by the way, ours is the only religion, Christianity, in which God reaches down and pulls us up. What we think about God is the most important thing about us. And when you think about God, do you see Jesus willingly went to the cross because it was the Father's will to build that bridge, to give us the opportunity to receive forgiveness, to receive redemption, to receive salvation, to receive His grace, and no amount of money could ever cover that. What is our meanwhile? In a moment, we'll have opportunity to share in the communion meal. When Jesus went to the cross, before Jesus went to the cross, Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, and, and Peter wasn't going to have it. The disciple Peter wasn't going to have it. You're not going to do that to me, Lord. I should, you know, I should be doing this to you. And Jesus says, well, if, if you don't let me wash you, then you won't have any part of me. Then, of course, he said, oh, just drench me then, Lord. 
there's always something that can potentially keep us from experiencing a deeper relationship with Jesus. And his desire is that we would take those meanwhile moments in our lives and just come to him just as Zacchaeus did, just bright-eyed, excited to be with him. Not that every day is full of excitement. In fact, most of the days are pretty mundane. But knowing that because I know, not fully, but I'm on my way to knowing him better and better each day, that I can trust him with my money, I can trust him with my attitude, I can trust him with my addictions, I can trust him with whatever challenge that I have in my life. Those are the moments that God desires that we would just grasp and be reminded that yeah, he's, he's in charge. He's, he hasn't forgotten me. He said, I'll never leave you. He sent the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, our comforter, our guide. And so as we receive this communion meal, maybe some of you, may, maybe even just one of you, I don't know, you're, you're struggling, you're wondering, but I, I heard something about proving, proving our salvation, not in the sense that, that it's about the things that I do, no, it, but, but it's, it's giving people the opportunity to look at me and, and, and say, yeah, I know he's the follower because he follows through on what he says he'll do and maybe I have something in my life that, that I'm struggling with because I know I haven't always followed through and I've hurt people. And you're wondering, can I take communion? The Bible says we need to examine our hearts before we do. That's important. It's important because we need to do it in the right order so we can experience God's favor and his blessing. Maddie and I are going to be outside that door there in the, in the prayer rooms. And if that's you this morning, if you're struggling, wondering if you should even take communion, we invite you just to walk on over and we can have a conversation about that. But after examining your heart, if you know that, no, I'm not perfect, but I know I'm forgiven. I know that I'm in right standing with my Lord. And this time is for you to come up to the center aisles here. We'll have a gluten-free option as well. I'm going to invite the uh, worship team, all two of them, to come on up. And they're going to be singing for us again about repentance. We can experience God's favor in our lives when we repent, when we turn around again. It's not because we're so smart or able. He gives us the capacity, the ability to do that. But it's those meanwhile moments in our lives that we need to be like Zacchaeus and, and just be ready. Okay, Lord, what are you going to do in my life today? Let's pray together. Lord, as, as, we, uh, as we think about eternity, and we think about the nation of Israel, and we think about the hotbed that is there. We think about the future. We think about salvation. Lord, may we not give people an opportunity in our lives to doubt our salvation. Lord, that our words would be backed up by action, like Zacchaeus. And that we could experience deliverance, whether it's money or other things. So Lord, help us now. Thank you that it's only by your grace. Thank you for your rich, extravagant love that you have poured out on our behalf. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.